so good. You like that little setup? I love that setup. That Welcome back. We're so glad to MC hear. Unpacked. That's right. Is that what this is called? It is. That's it's the title. It's been so long. I don't even know what this is called anymore. What are we yeah. even doing here? Talking. What are we talking? Singing. No, not, We're not singing like currently. Too. What is the purpose of this? <laughs> Why are we here? We're Who cat- are we? I don't know. Like, tell the listener <laughs> what we're doing. Set up you the threw, stage. You threw me off. I'm so getting a LaCroix. Y'all have fun. Oh, my goodness. Hey, we are here. My name is Megan. This is Carrie. And, uh, well, he is here. He's just uh, busying himself at the moment. But um, <laughs> we are so excited that you're tuned in. We pastor the Movement Church in Orange County, California. So if you're listening from somewhere else, hey, this this is a little bit about who we are. I'm a little disappointed that you couldn't roll a little better than that. Oh my goodness. Here's my Pamplemousse LaCroix. I had no clue what was happening. Yeah. That's a good opening right there. So good. Cheers. And you interrupted my introduction. I thought we were both introducing. You just left. Oh no, I was like, I asked like, <laughs> where, where, what are we doing here? And you like looked at me like, I don't know. What are we doing here? I, I was so confused. So did you finish? Go ahead. Tell them what we're doing. I don't even know where I stopped. We also uh, are married <laughs> sometimes. And we pass our church in Orange County. Occasionally. And the whole heartbeat behind this podcast is to either supplement a sermon series that we're in or unpack maybe some difficult topics or just talk and have a good time. Yeah. Uh, definitely some ad lib songs sung in falsetto. You um, never know what to our expect last podcast. When you show our dogs up here. went nuts, That's and true. we got up. In Could the happen again today. Yeah, because we don't really care. Who knows? I mean, you left it in the first like minute of our podcast. It's because you stalled. I was like, I have to go now. <laughs> okay, you're like. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is entertaining for me this is why, I never know what to expect. This is why you need my leadership. This is why I need, <laughs> it's actually true. It's actually Which true. Which is a great segue All right. into the topic we are going to hit on tonight, and that is the topic of women in ministry. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know why you say it like that. Like dun, I don't know, dun, because dun. I feel like it just makes it more fun, because right now, the people listening, there's three categories of people. Right. Category one, they don't know or care right. or have a, a dog in the fight. Yeah. Category two, uh, they are lean towards the hardcore. Everyone is equal. The Bible may be old school, archaic. We've missed some things. Category three is, nope, there's clearly defined order. And let's put women in a corner and tell them to be quiet. Oh, my gosh. Obviously, these are extremes. Yeah, that is an extreme. Yeah, both are extremes. <laughs> And so we would, thought we'd talk about it. And I, actually, it's a question we get asked a lot because yeah. our functioning role is co-lead pastor of uh, the Movement Church. And so, um, but really the reason we thought we'd talk about this um, is, is really twofold. Number one, we get asked this a lot. We get asked, what's our stance on yeah. that? But then also, if you've uh, been paying attention to the, to the news or reports that have come out very Especially, recently. Especially, I think, if you're in Southern California. No, it was national, national okay. news. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, national news. It, w- at about a week before the time of this recording, um, a small church right here in our backyard called Saddleback Church. Tiny church. Uh, tiny little church. Not, not very significant. No purpose in their Gosh. church whatsoever. <laughs> I've been, I was kind of hoping they find some purpose-driven initiatives yeah, for like, so they can live yeah, a purpose-driven founded life. Founded by, you yeah. know, America's pastor, Rick Warren, and they are an amazing church here. And they just got a brand new pastor. I believe his yeah. name is Andy Wood. Yeah. I've not met Andy him. and Stacy Wood. Andy and Stacy yeah. Wood. That's not his name. He's no, not, doesn't go wife. by both pronouns. He and his wife. His pronouns are he, wow. him. Okay. This is good. And, uh, and so that's he and his wife are pastoring that church. Now just took over for Pastor Rick and Kay Warren, who, yeah. Crazy legacy. They planted the church the year I was born. Yeah. And I'm 25, so they're pastors for 25 years. Incredible is, legacy in yeah. Southern California. Yeah, we to- are so blessed. Globally. 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 But I I feel like we're reaping the benefits oh, of that one, here. As a church, yeah. we are, we're reaping the benefit of like ground, like worked hard, yeah. plowed, and yeah. prepared. And gosh, and he really did revolutionize the way we do church right. today. And so obviously the, the couple taking over, huge shoes to fill. Yeah. But, from everything I hear, uh, friends who know him and his wife, they just say they're great leaders. And so we're stoked to watch the journey and, and hopefully get to know them as well. Yeah. But we're talking about it because, bum, bum, bum. Well, take it away, Megan. <laughs> okay. We're talking about it because Saddleback Church used to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. and uh, Which is a denomination. It's a denomination. For those of you that don't know. And they uh, were just removed from the denomination because they ordained women as pastors. You're using a lot of they's in there. So what happened is <laughs> Thank you. Saddleback Church's new pastor, Andy Wood, put his wife in, ordained her as a pastor on their staff. And as a result, the Southern Baptist Convention 
kicked Saddleback Church out because they no longer were in friendship or alignment with the Southern Baptist Church's statement of faith and theology. And that's yeah. a big deal. It is a big deal. I think one thing that's important to note on this podcast is that um, I, I talked about this last week or so in church, but we... Uh, nobody knows what week this Nobody airing, knows what week so. it is. You'll have to hunt for the I message if you're looking for it. I recently was speaking about this. <laughs> Well, we talked about the fact that in, in our faith that there's some essentials of the faith that really do matter. Like there's some essentials that we are not going to waver on, the fact that Jesus is Lord. We're not going to waver on that. The, the fact that the Bible is... Why are you laughing I have at me? a fundamental problem with the thing you just said. There are some things that really do matter, which insinuates there are other things <laughs> that really don't matter. There are things that we call non-essentials, right. and that's but what I'm talking about. But they still matter. About. They okay. still matter. Okay. Yeah. They still matter, but there's disagreements on them. Yes. And the essentials, the, the key that holds the essentials together, which is important, is the fact that the essentials lead to salvation. Right. Those essentials are there is only one God, yep. that Jesus is his son, and that Jesus is the way to heaven or salvation. Yeah. Those would be the essential. Bible is the, the inherent Bible word is of God, not the inherent word of God. The Bible, in my opinion, it's the infallible word of yeah. God. The inherent would mean that it would has no mistakes. So if they said, uh, you know, he, Jesus fed the 5000, but there was 4997. Well, now the Bible is inerrant and it can't be the word of God. So that that would be a little bit of a difference. I know it's what you meant. Yeah. But yeah. And so we we have essential beliefs. We hold to those. But there are ones that are non-essentials. They still matter. Yeah. And these are gray areas where there are multiple positions. There's arguments beliefs. on either side of right. the conversations. I mean, right. for instance, we did a podcast a while back about alcohol. Right. And is it totally. okay to drink? And and you've got different denominations that would take a different stance. Totally. Based on different scriptures. And so there's lots of conversations to be had. And we would just call those non-essentials. Yeah. And in the essentials... We have unity, unity, and the non-essentials. We have liberty, and in all beliefs, we have, we have compassion. compassion. Which means, no matter what yeah. you believe, we have compassion towards you. I have a little burp coming up right oh, now. Oh boy, here we go. What do we have in burps? Do we have unity? No, mm. not tonight. It's oh not coming goodness. up yet. I'm working on it. Sorry. Stay focused, babe. Stay focused. I am focused. <laughs> I'm very focused. You just okay. I feel great. like the carbonation is welling up in deep inside my bones. Again, another promo for Lacroix. Yeah, my favorite what, flavor. What flavor are you Limoncello. consuming right now? This is my favorite One of, our of favorite. all times. And then I'm still on the Pamplemousse, yeah, uh, aka grapefruit. This so. one's like lemon and vanilla it's mixed beautiful. together. It is. Yeah, it's fabulous. It's a good combo. Cheers. All right, so. Um, Saddleback Church gets kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention, from which they've been a part of for forty-three years and of which they were probably the largest, most influential church within the Southern Baptist Convention. Yeah. And it's stirring up a lot of hoopla. And a lot of questions. The kids, as the kids say wow. these days. hoopla. Hoopla. Because you were born in the 20s. Man, see, Chan, <laughs> I knew what do you think about that Southern Baptist Convention, see? Huh? I, I need to pull that <laughs> It's the bee's out. knees, that old Rick Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Back to reality and the topic. Back to life. Yeah, back to reality. Um, so we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to unpack um, some different perspectives. Yeah. And we're going to unpack specifically the perspective that we hold at the yeah. Movement Church. And here's the fun part. The really exciting part is, I know this is shocking to many, but Megan and I, we are, we are in alignment and we're in agreement but if there is a middle, we're on either sides of that middle. Now we're hugging, yeah, like this. Like, we're hugging close. Yeah. We're hugging this. Like, we're we're disagreeing, but we're hugging closely. You gotta be in the microphone. Like <laughs> <laughs> our, our production team is trying to eat and not choke while laughing. Right now. So I think that's important for you to know. Now the unfortunate part is Megan's theologically in, inaccurate. <laughs> okay. She's a sister in arrow. It's not a big wow. deal. We're praying for her. Wow. No, but she again. This is non essentials, and and her her where she lands on this uh, she has biblical grounds for that, and where I land on this has accurate biblical grounds. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And so this is the beauty. We're of not going to have a debate today. We're we're no, we're going to no, no, unpack we, some no scripture for you about women. Yeah. Leading in ministry within the church. And our greatest hope would be yeah. that you take this and, and maybe it brings clarity for yeah. what you, where you kind of line and maybe it causes you to ask some questions. And if you want to yeah. uh, shoot us an email and ask questions, we'd love to entertain that yeah. and talk through that and, and it would help us out. But let's talk through this. So let's do it. A couple of things like groundwork would be 
Number one, uh, it's, it's a word called epistemology. It's the way of learning yeah. things and how we explore and learn and understand scripture. Yeah. And so we never, we don't get the, uh, the luxury of cherry picking a verse uh, and saying, well, I have one verse, I'm holding on to that, and therefore whatever context <laughs> I give it is now factually right. accurate. Which so many people do. Tons of For people do. everything. For ages. <laughs> For ages. And uh, like, like you've probably heard the statement, money is the root of all evil, which is derivative from scripture and completely inaccurate because the verse is the love of money right. is the root of all right. evil. So people will cherry pick that and uh -huh. then say, if you have too much money, you're inherently evil or you yeah. have problems. And so we, we have to look at scripture and go, there's multiple ways to look at this. Go ahead. I was just going to say, people find scriptures to support their claims yeah. versus examining the scripture and the, the context of the scripture, the wholeness of the scripture and what's being said. Yeah, so. we have to look at, um, you know, when we read the scripture, specifically if we're reading Paul in the New Testament, yeah. we have to say, is this, does this it, consistent with all of Paul's teaching yeah. throughout the scripture. Is it consistent with Paul's behavior throughout the scripture? Yeah, and, and we have to ask, is it yeah. consistent with the rest of scripture? We yeah. have to ask, there's the burp. Oh, that Thank smells you for not good. That. We have to ask. I'm glad nobody That burp out is there not consistent with the rest of my life right Woo. now. Is right. this consistent with historic interpretation, which is matter? And that's a, yeah. a, a, for major debate. Yeah. I think I want to do a podcast all about historical Christian orthodoxy. Um, which I'm sure most of you won't care about, but um, it, that is up for debate and in, in, in tragically, in yeah. my opinion. And, uh, and so there's just different ways that we look at scripture. And so when it comes to women in ministry, there are four primary viewpoints about it. The first would be tradi a traditional viewpoint, and that would be, uh, you know, women do women things and guys do guys things. It's kind guys, of hysterical that you're giving it a Southern accent. Guys, hunt, well, but it also, <laughs> but it rings also like, so true. Touché, you know, touché. guys hunt and play golf and women wear dresses and <laughs> wow. have children and cook dinner, which I like. I'm a fan of the traditional view. Are you? I am. Okay. Well, uh, sad, sad for you. The, the, uh, the antithesis to that would be the progressive view, which yeah. is always changing. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you interview a feminist from the 1960s, a feminist from the 1980s, a feminist from the 1990s, and a feminist from today, they're all going to have different ideologies and interpretations yeah. of the word masculinity. Yeah. And so uh, it's just ever changing. Yeah. And I, I do think that feminism, man, we could do a whole podcast to unpack that, but feminism is not the hatred of men. And um, I think it's gotten twisted that way a little bit lately. And it is now. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it yeah. has led to that, but yeah. it really was the advocacy of women's rights based on their gender. And, uh, totally. and that's where it started. And so I think that it's gotten off course. And so I think that as women, um, like the right to own property, the right to vote. I mean, just basic yeah, fundamental just some basic rights. Fundamental rights. And I think that as women, we've gotten so like, I need to defend my rights that in doing so it's been like slamming men totally. And that doesn't work either. So that's the nature of our world yeah. today. It's like, if I stand for something, it means I have to stand against something. Or if you disagree with my stance, yeah. we are now enemies instead of, well, we just don't agree. But we need men and women together. And, we need masculine uh, men. We, we do. Need we guys do need who some aren't masculine afraid men. of leading and being strong That's right. and courageous. And we need women who aren't afraid to be quiet and. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. This is going to all night. Just prepare yourself. <laughs> I just Bring, don't know who's listening. I mean, I surely. Oh, well, that's irrelevant. Oh, my God. Okay. So traditional <laughs> We need view. women who are, who are confident yeah. in their identity in Christ and who God called them to be. Yeah. We need both men and women confident in their identity in Christ, operating and working together as God created them to. As God created yeah. them. Yeah. I yeah. love that. That was wise, babe. Very wise. Got to bring some wisdom in the there. The third. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> right now. The third would be biblical egalitarianism. Yeah. And um, egal, not not eagle it's egal <laughs> as in the word equal. And uh, and this is the idea, the notion that men and women um, are equal in Christ, equal in value, and equal in role. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is primarily based off Galatians 3. We'll talk about this some later. Um, and, and probably an underlying fundamental concept of that would be that women can function in any way uh, that they would choose in both home and yeah. in church. Yeah. And uh, then the fourth would be biblical complementarianism uh, or to be biblical complement complementarian. 
and the idea of we complete or we we um uh not the word we complement sorry not we you you com- complete you complete me, me. but we complement so <laughs> we are designed um uniquely and differently and we complement one another mm-hmm. uh it's the idea that men and women are equal in our redemptive need but our roles actually remain somewhat different yeah uh and it's it, it this is where where um you get a lot of theology where uh they believe that um teaching and preaching would be governmental and that role would be primarily for men. Mm-hmm. And whereas it separates from egalitarian, it would say that it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you should all have the uh, the same authority and role. Mm-hmm. We're gonna unpack that. Yeah. And and just like, think about um, if you go to, to steal an illustration from Ian Morgan Cron, um, if you were to go to Home Depot, if I was to send you to Home Depot and ask you to pick out a paint color that is white, Oh my goodness. And you go to look, there's like 750 options of white. There's so many whites. (laughs) Because the shades vary and the tints and all the different colors. So when you look at these, we're going to mostly focus in on egalitarianism, egalitarian and complementarian. Yeah. And and we're going to look at that. But you got to know that just like at Home Depot, there are multiple shades. So you're going to have extremes on on all sides. Yeah. So, um, so let's just kind of dive in here. Yeah. And then, babe, I don't know if you have something you want to jump into or You just lead go, the way and we'll oh, go from there. Oh, thank you for letting me lead the way. So I appreciate what you did there. Uh-huh. Um, so what we want to do is kind of have this theological perspective. So um, there, there's a different setup for both of these. And when it comes to egalitarian, um, it really is based or stems off the scripture of Galatians 3 that says, uh, in verse 27, 28, all who have been ju- united and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in yeah, Christ. Christ. And that is a great scripture. Yeah. And that's probably the major, um, the major base scripture for an egalitarian viewpoint. Where, where I would differ in this is that um, that scripture specifically is what's called salvific in nature. So it is referring to salvation, that, uh, be, that no matter your culture, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter your heritage, you're in need of a Savior, yeah. and salvation is for, for you. you. Uh, I, I would argue personally that that isn't necessarily... Uh, having to do with uh, what roles we play in church. So yeah. let me just kind of give the base for where we land as a church, and then we'll just kind of unpack this and see where it goes. Because okay. um, I've just got a lot of things I want to hit on. But as a church and as as a pastor, we would be what, what I would refer to as lowercase c complementarian. Another way of saying that is soft complementarian. And what, what I want to go ahead and pause and tell you right there is that Megan and I operate as co-lead pastor. She is a chief communicator and preaches at least 40%, if not 50% of the time. And you set the preaching schedule. <laughs> I don't even set that. So she determines who's preaching and when. Uh, of our four executive team members, two of our executive pastors are female. And our number two, so if we yeah. die or if we're gone, it, it's a female. And so we are 100% empowering of women, and we believe wholeheartedly that women can serve and operate in any role, in any capacity within the church. Yeah. Here's where I align theologically, and, and Megan aligns with us, yeah. even though she has some differings of opinions, and where our church aligns, is we believe that women can f- facilitate any role within the church under the headship of a man. Say la. I wanted to just let that sink for a minute because I know (laughs) this is challenging. It's challenging in our culture. Mm -hmm. It's challenging because there has been rampant toxic masculinity both in the church and in our world. Yeah, for sure. And especially in the polarizing world that we've been in since 2020, this is a challenge. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want want me to talk about that? Yeah, I think that 
in the culture that we're in right now, it would to talk about the there being a, a headship in the, in the male. It feels like it's the supreme authority, the dictator, the oppressor. In fact, I, I think that that's been a label that's been given lately has been totally. the oppressor. But that's not that's not the objective in the scripture. And um, there are there are roles that God's called all of us to play in the body of Christ and and created us um, in a way to really flourish in those roles. And I think that um, sometimes that becomes a frustration yeah to people and i think in the culture we're living in it it's a real big one 100 percent. yeah so one of the reasons that we pull this from is we will pull and we'll, we'll read from the scripture and a little bit that'll be ephesians chapter 5 I'm where we to see this scripture this right picked now out. too that's why i was but trying. when we look through when we look at, at the way god has structured everything in the scripture there's always an or an order yeah. there's order to everything there is order to how God created the heavens and, and the earth. There's order in our system, our bodily yeah. system, our skeletal system, our nervous system, our muscular system. Everything has an order and function to it. When you look in the Old Testament, in the building of the tabernacle in Exodus, there is a specific order. Detailed. Detailed yeah. to everything from the frame to the structure to what goes into the stitching of the curtains on the outside exterior walls. Right. And we see that all the way through to the Trinity. And the Trinity is God, three persons, and one. And when we look at the Trinity, we see order established. So the Trinity is equal in deity. They're all God. They're three distinct persons, but of the same substance. Yeah. Three distinct personalities and three distinct diversity and functions but the first among them is god the father and we read in john chapter 3 jesus saying i only do the will of the father the father is not sent jesus yeah. was sent so god establishes the order he has a strategy and they are co-equal but god the father is first right and then he sent the holy spirit and we read in the scripture that the Holy Spirit doesn't even speak on his own behalf. He speaks on behalf of the Father. We read that in John 16 and other verses. So we see that their, their equality is not based on function or ability, but rather from divine. And so we are equal in humanity. We are yeah. equal in need of a Savior. But we're not equal in the fact that you can have a baby. That is true. I cannot. No matter what, no matter what anybody else is, is currently telling teaching, you today, if you don't have a uterus, you <laughs> can't have a baby or a period. Yeah, Let's I just saw just a throw video about there. a guy come telling the world he's trans and he's telling the world I do have a period, and I'm thinking, how's that even possible? Yeah, but that's yeah. not what today Let's not talk is about. about. That right now, that's just, and, just crazy. And you play a role in our home I can never play. Yeah, but that doesn't diminish my role, right? And I play a role in our home. We have two girls, 18, or 19, and I'm about to be 14. Yeah, this week. I play a role in our home that you can never play, but that doesn't diminish your role. Right. And when we look at the church, we need the role of spiritual moms. Yep. And we need the role of spiritual fathers. So God, in Genesis, he established from the beginning male and female. He didn't say they, them, and ji He just said... Two distinct beings, yeah, equal in nature, yet different. So we have to look at that and go, obviously, it's not 100% equal. Not, e not talking about value. Yeah. Not talking and role. About, the roles are not the yeah, same. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah. And I feel like that's an important note to, to hit on. Did you want to elaborate on that at all? No, I was looking for a different structure. Oh, okay. So. I couldn't tell where you were going with that. So yeah. all that to say, <laughs> we see this distinction in our functionality and we see order in how god established things with the role of the trinity and then we see that begin to translate down there's a burp oh that was goodness. a good one we see i'm paul please excuse, excuse me and forgive me <laughs> we see that translate down into the church and we read that in ephesians chapter 5 and where we read that the scripture says this and this is a challenging one for wives, in fact, I think this is the most challenging. Like, yeah. like we can see equality all through scripture when we see diversity of function, but this one is like we have to go, wait, let's push pause and think. What were we gonna say? No, go ahead. I was just gonna agree with you. I keep asking for your, your input. This well, is the first time in the history 
of our ministry in the history of our time together since March 19th, 1997, I've asked her three times if she wants to weigh in and she said no. Here's the thing. I can't wait. I'm not going to, I'm not going to steer us off course of what you're talking about right now because what you're talking about is important. Um, I appreciate so that. So I, I think you need to hit on this. Yeah. And I, I think that this is one of those scriptures too where there's different, um, there's so many different um, interpretations of the scripture. I don't agree with that. I know you don't. So that's where I was trying not to take over. That's, okay. that's what this makes in. this podcast okay. exciting. Great. So the, Ephesians 5.22 says this, and we have to just go, okay, Paul, you, you, you line this out. We see some of these same notes and, and context reiterated in New Testament throughout multiples of your writings, but it says this, for wives, this means submit to your husbands mm -hmm. as to the Lord, for a husband is the head of the wife, and here we see the order established again, as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church, and as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now the verse goes on for those that are uh, that maybe lean towards the extreme egalitarian side. You're freaking out right now, and and for those of you that lean to the extreme complementarian, you're like, yeah, that's about right, woman. You better submit. You know, you're both of you are probably listening right now. G. E. Paul comes back in and he says, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. Yeah. So there's not this 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 idea where. Well, the husband uh, is the the ma the toxic masculine male who you know comes in the house and everyone bows to his whims because Paul said submit to your husbands you know cute little lady make sure their dinner's ready at six p.m. and then when he's done you wash the dishes and he's gonna go sit in his armchair and crack open a Coors Light oh and goodness. you know watch some. All in the family. I don't know what this came You out. are just like <laughs> taking it down a trail. 99% of our listeners have wow. no clue what all in the family I, seriously. is. But, so, so Paul comes back in and goes, but wait, 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 wait. This is not just you rule the roost and everyone bows to you. He comes back and says, but, but you love your wives and give up everything for her. So we definitely see this beautiful picture where we are we're instructed to serve each other right the verse before paul is talking to the entire church and says submitting one another out of reverence so in other words submit yourself one to another as a, as that that scripture specifically yeah. to the church yeah. and then he shifts to husbands and wives but that would mean like hey as i'm looking at off camera at our production crew like i'm here to serve you you're here to serve me because the entire Christian leadership is all about how can I get behind people and push them forward towards their calling in Christ? Yeah. How can I get behind them and, 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 and help empower them to be who God's called them to be? When Jesus says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, it's saying this is going to pay a physical toll. Mm -hmm. It's saying this is going to cost you mentally and emotionally. It's there, nowhere do we see yeah. in scripture that a woman can be oppressed. Right. Nowhere do we see that this well, is Well, especially some, not from Jesus or from Paul. No. But maybe That's in some... That's a great yeah. point. Jesus would never be tyrannical <laughs> yeah. or oppressive. Yeah. He would be filled with grace and mercy. And his number one goal would be that the woman could become everything God created her to well, be. Well, Jesus historically brought more freedom to women than they had ever experienced Once. before. So did Paul. And so did Paul. I Yeah, Paul was the one that came in and talked about, I, well, I won't go into all that Do right it. now. Do it, it's fine. I, I Don't worry about the notes. order, let's just have fun with well, this. Well, Paul came in and he talked about... We, we, um, God already gave us order. We don't have to have order in our podcast. Perfect, perfect. He talked about uh, honoring one another and submitting to one another with your, your bodies. Like, yeah. give give to one another. And back in the day, I don't know if I... You can correct me if I'm wrong because I, I don't I will, have those notes pulled up in front of me. Because you have to submit to me. All right, you're annoying. <laughs> um... <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to pull up those notes, but Paul talked about this and this was such freedom for the women because back in the day, like back in biblical times, women did not have the right didn't to have any divorce rights. their husband. No. They didn't have the right to their own body. They didn't, no. they didn't have any rights. And what Paul did. They were betrothed. Said, you didn't even have a choice in love. Yeah. You, you were given a husband and sometimes at a very young age. Yeah. And it was, it was quite nasty sometimes. So Paul came in and placed value upon yeah. women and men together. And yet Paul is the one that is often the most misinterpreted Touted as yeah. the hardcore, 
shut up woman. Yeah, and don't women speak. should be silent in church. Yeah, and there's and context like, for every one of those scriptures. Yeah, let's talk about what he was handling in that moment. Let's talk about who he was talking to. So I just think Jesus, when you look at the life of Jesus, when you look at the life of Paul, they place value on women oh, in yeah. a beautiful way. I mean, way. talk about some of the women that Paul empowered in his ministry. Oh my goodness. I mean, well, in, in all of Paul's letters, he mentions 10 women and 17 men. So at least 37% yeah. of the names that Paul mentions as far as people who are influencing and building the church, at least 37% of them are and women. And pause right there. That would have been unheard of. Yeah. Just, just even one or two would have been massive, but yeah. 10 insinuates this was a common yeah. occurrence in the New Testament church. I mean, Phoebe preached yep. the gospel and prophesied. From friends. Yep. Smelly cat. Not that Smelly Phoebe. cat. <laughs> Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, they yeah. were uh, husband and wife husband duo. Husband and wife duo that worked together. Bivocational pastors. But her name is mentioned first. first. Massive. Which tends to tends to imply, and this is one interpretation of scripture, would be that she that she was probably took a um, more of a more, a of, more a, of a dominant role. Not dominant. Is that the right word? Um, focal role. Yeah. So her role, in fact, one of the chief communicators in the New Testament, his name was Apollos, and it was a big deal because Paul was the writer and he was short and ugly and just He mean probably didn't and angry. speak very well. He probably looked like me, just bald and fat and <laughs> just it. angry. Kind of like You're handsome. Like, oh, thank you. That's like like you Stop this making is, that face. Ah, don't touch my throat. <laughs> woman. Oh my gosh, I almost punched you. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh man. This is like all cratchety would preach and people stop. stop touching me. <laughs> and when, when when he would preach, literally a guy fell asleep while he was preaching and fell out of a window. Yeah, he was and probably died. a boring preacher. And then Apollos, he had it was eloquent and the way he would communicate and storytell, it was beautiful. And oh, it you actually like Apollos, babe. Oh gosh, you're so kind. <laughs> I appreciate that. It was beautiful. And and so Apollos, because he was great at communication, he grew in fame. Yeah. But he was so new to the faith, he was yeah. started teaching heresy. He was a little off in what he, he was, was teaching. He was off. He would say things that sounded so good. And Paul's like, mm, that's not, maybe not. That's not right. And you know what he did to bring yeah. instruction to Apollos, who is like this up and coming YouTube influencer? Yeah. What did he do, babe? He had Priscilla and Aquila take him under their wing. They to mentored train Apollos. Him to teach him. That, that flew in the face of Absolutely. the culture of that day to have a woman be a mentor with her husband to a man. Yeah. That that was not common by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. Yeah. In fact, what I love is that 300 years after Paul, I mean, I guess it would have technically been like 230 years after Paul, at the conversion of Constantine, the great uh, warrior who became emperor of Rome, who legalized Christianity, he made Christianity the national language for all of the empire of Rome. It was one of the best things, and there were some challenges to it, <laughs> one of the best things that happened to Christianity because it forced the Nicene Council. It forced us to actually stop and talk about things in a powerful way so we could systemize it. But what I love is 240 years after Paul's death, Constantine comes on the scene and he's changing the world, and it was because of Paul's writings yeah. that Constantine changed the laws in the empire regarding women and yeah. slaves. Yeah. It was crazy. And so this was a common occurrence. So the the polarity of the extremism, it existed in the Old Testament church, but it was more with those that would hold to a Jewish faith versus those that held to Christian faith. And now we see it because I just think people like to find hills to die on yeah. that are either rooted and grounded in pride or rooted and grounded in, in insecurity or and I'm gonna, or power on both sides. Uh, yeah, absolutely. On both men and women. Yeah. And it's 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 foolish and rubbish. Yeah. And ru rubbish, in my opinion. <laughs> absolutely. Keep going. You're doing great job. Oh, I was just reading names. Phoebe, Priscilla, Mary, Junia, Trifina, Trifosa, Persis. Talks about Rufus's if mother. If you're pregnant and you're considering names, <laughs> Trifina don't. and Trifosis are really good ones. <laughs> they sound terrible. Trifina and Tri... sound like an STD is what it sounds like. It What's wrong? I think terrible. I got the trifosa. <laughs> you got any penicillin, so penicillin doc? That, that poor woman. Oh, um, she but had it, the trifosa. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it, Paul names off all of these women that are, that are really 
bringing the gospel and the good news to the the area where they were living and working and ministering. And so I just think, um, I, I think that sometimes people cherry pick the scriptures and they don't look at the context of who Paul was and what he was really doing and 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 how he was empowering women. They tend to take First Timothy 2. This is well, what either First Timothy 2 ago. or First Corinthians 14. Yep. First Timothy 2. Um, when Paul's like, I don't permit a woman to teach uh, men or have authority over them, it was because he was addressing a culture of uh, Diana worship, and it was like this this whole feminine-driven, we are going to dominate men, females are first, men are secondary. Um, it was very sexual in nature, yeah. but it was well, a that cult. Was, yeah, and that, that was, was one surging. place where women... In that culture currently, that was one place where women could really be dominant and lead was in the temple worshiping Diana. Diana. Exactly. And so they, so then they started getting saved. Yeah, they're getting saved. They're finding Jesus and they're trying to bring the same culture from the temple worshiping Diana. They're trying to bring the same culture yep. into the church. And it was disruptive and it was causing problems. And and it just like, yeah. just like it, it happened in all churches, yeah. people tried to bring external culture yeah. into the the kingdom of God and so what Paul did is he did what a good loving father does yeah. just like if you have a child who he's like getting on his phone and playing games and he's got your credit card information and he's buying things in the app and he's in all of a sudden he spends a couple hundred bucks you're like what in the world that's it you're not going to use your phone for the rest of your life you don't get to <laughs> breathe except for on Tuesdays you're not going to talk to your friend what do you do you swing you respond. the pendulum because you are going to correct this scenario and everybody on the planet knows, well, your kid's going to get his phone back. Yeah. You know that he's going to breathe on more days than Tuesday. You know that he's going to get to hang out with his friends. So when Paul's writing this yeah. in Timothy, he's overcorrecting yeah. and, and he's specifically saying, talking to the people in to this, this, specific this specific culture, because culture. we look at this all through scripture. You have to take all yeah. of Paul's writings. You have to take all of the new Testament writing the and epistemology it, of the scripture. The, we, the epistemology is how we process yeah. and learn this information. It's called hermeneutically. We have to pull it from all pieces and look at it. So that scripture in Timothy, as in Titus, that's what yeah. Paul is hitting on specific things. Then in Corinthians, we hear, uh, we see Paul saying things like, um, uh, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace and that is true. That is true. Uh, as in all thing, as in all the meetings of God's holy people, women should be silent during church meetings. It's not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. And so he goes on and he says this: uh, If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church meetings. Or do you think God's word originated with it? So he goes on and he's saying, "Hey, don't let women speak in church." Which I agree with. That's the end of our podcast. Yeah, the no. end. I'm done. So what is he saying? Well, you got to take the context. You got to know who is Paul writing to. Um, the, the church in Corinth. The, to to li Corinth was like if Vegas was on crack and snorted cocaine. That is Corinth. There was a saying that would to Corinthianize meant to be yeah. sexually just loose and rampant Wild. and just sleep with whomever you want whenever and, you and want whenever you want what was the name of that woman and get the theomopolith what was it <laughs> what was I it called no what, Therpephaly. what was her name <laughs> triophilusionist <laughs> so to, to trifina. Get trifina. trifina get the trifina what was i was in <laughs> corinth and what happens in corinth doesn't stay in corinth <laughs> I mean, there was like thousands of prostitutes. The most famous uh, prostitute in the land was in Corinth. When Paul originally writes to Corinth, he's addressing a guy who's sleeping with his mom. So there's just crazy, crazy yeah. business happening. And Paul was not afraid of calling he out the care. issues. He did not care. And here's what was happening. So the women at the time were uneducated. Yeah. And, and either they came from a Jewish background, yep. which historically women would sit behind some lattice and they would watch as the men got to learn in the big room with all the real yeah, adults and the yeah. rabbi would teach them. But in Corinth, they were uneducated. And so they're in there learning about this and, and somebody is teaching to them and the women didn't understand. So they're sitting on the opposite side of the room from their husband and they're like, hey, babe, hey, <laughs> what's he talking about? What does he mean? <laughs> What are, you, what are you talking about? Propitiation. It's like, that, so, it's like that one random person in church when, who doesn't when you're realize preaching you don't who talk. just like 
like talks to you. Well, and we like, like people to be like, amen, but like, you know, the yeah, but, awkward ones. But like the awkward ones. Yeah. So that's what it was. They were yelling across the room to their spouse going, hey, help me understand this. So Paul says, hey, let's have the women remain silent. He's talking specifically here to Corinth and we'll pull why I mean that in a minute. And he's saying, hey, teach him at home. Like tell him, hey, babe, during church service today, if you don't understanding, get your iPhone out, take a note. <laughs> and when we get home, I'll do the best to unpack this yeah. for you. So so you look at these and these are scriptures that have become like foundation oh, stones yeah. for hardcore, uh, like sh- capital C complementarianism or complementarian. But then you look at, at 1 Corinthians 11. And this is one of the main passages where we know we pull context, both scriptures, and we go multiple scriptures. We know that that the other scriptures were Paul isolatedly talking to a specific church and a specific region with that specific cultural narrative. Because in 1 Corinthians, we read again, it says this. This is verse uh, chapter 11, verse 2. It says, I'm so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. But there's one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. So Paul, again, he's establishing headship. He's establishing the Trinity. He's establishing order in the church and in the family, which it is synonymous. Okay. I'm not looking to tell you. Wow. I was just like including you in this. (laughs) The verse goes on. This is one that gets thrown out all the time. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying, but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For the same, for this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering and she goes on, but since it is so shameful for a woman to ha- have her hair cut her head shaved, she should wear a covering and a man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping for a man is made in the God. So he's unpacking these things. And so what you have to do is pause and not get mixed up here with the cultural stuff, the head coverings component. Right. Why? Because all clothing in that day and age had symbolism to yeah. it. There Meaning. were right pieces of clothing to wear right times, right? Like right. for instance, it would be inappropriate for you to preach in, in this week in a bikini. Yeah. I feel like we don't even have to say that. If you right. came out in a bikini, people are like, I don't know. They would, <laughs> they would I, never. I, they'd be mesmerized. Ever I happen. would be. I wouldn't be able to contain Hell would myself. Freeze over. But you would just be like, this is really awkward. It feels awkward. Just like I mean, just talking about it's awkward. I, I'm going to be running a Spartan race in a couple months. It would be really awkward if I only wore a kilt and nothing else oh above or gosh. below. Just you, you get it. You get the idea that clothing has symbolism to it, and there's appropriate yeah. times to wear certain things. Yeah. So in this time frame, that was a cultural in, thing. In, in Roman and Greek cults, uh, women would do two things while participating. They would put their hair up, and if it was covered, it was cultic, and it was a re- it was a certain religious yeah. way of observing things. Yeah. So Paul's saying now this is becoming a distraction yeah. that you actually are holding on to cultural values that we do not adhere to. So don't. I- I think that's worth stopping and pausing on because it it. was becoming a distraction. And and that's the thing. Like there's so many times where I feel like in the church today, people want to prove their point and they go to the extreme to prove a point, but it's a distraction to what God's trying to do. And I think that's what Paul was addressing was that. And so as a, as a woman, I think all of us, regardless of your gender, it, we've got to guard our hearts to not try to prove points and scenarios and yeah. situations that not are going to be a as, distraction to the gospel of Jesus. And the same for me as a man. Yeah. It, both of us, that we, it's too easy for us to become the distraction. Yeah. So if you get, if you get caught up in the distraction of this passage of scripture, you'll, you'll lose the message that Paul's saying. He, the message of the scripture is not about head coverings and not head coverings, not wearing head covering. Look at, look at the obvious in this passage of scripture. We see both men and women praying and prophesying in public in church. Yeah. And in this context, we can look at prophesying and preaching as the same thing. So we see Paul who's admonishing and saying, Hey, as you are leading, as you are preaching, as you are being used by God with the gifts of prophecy, 
make sure that you're not doing so in a distracting right, way. Right, right. What he's not saying is women cannot preach or prophesy. Now, some would argue that this is different from teaching, and some that would lean a little more towards the conservative side of complementarian would say that teaching is governmental. In other words, to teach would be to instruct and would therefore place me as the head. We do not hold that mm. ideology at the movement right. church. That would be a non-essential. Right. And so we don't hold that, whether it's preaching, teaching, prophesying, leading, instructing. Har- very um, conservative and hardcore complementarian would say that women should not instruct, teach, pastor, or lead any adult males, only kids or women. Just we like to silence about 50% of the church. <laughs> We don't need you. Just saying. We don't need it. We don't need that. I let me say boldly, I do not hold to that theology. I I don't find that consistent with Paul's writings. Okay. This is a non-essential. It doesn't matter which side of this you land on. Right. We still can find grace in all and beliefs. Salvation. We have compassion. No, that wouldn't qualify. This would be a non-essential. It would be we have liberty. Well, liberty, but yeah. we also show compassion towards one another oh, if we disagree. Oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah totally, that's all totally, I'm trying totally. to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, I, that, so if you are at the movement church, you need to know that's where. So again, we, we would hold like a soft complementarian or a, a lowercase c complementarian, and that is that we believe women can preach, teach, and lead yeah. in every capacity of the church under the headship of a man. And I know that's challenging because what does that actually mean? Does that mean that I have to be submitted to some toxic masculinity? No. Uh, When we look at the word head or headship, the the Greek word used, it's used 50 different times in the New Testament. It's used over and over and over again in extra biblical Greek literature, in other words, non-biblical literature. And the word always means authority or a business owner or a master. So what that means is that there is headship. In other words, there's a spiritual male governance. And I know that those that are listening right now, this is probably challenging for some of you. And for me, I don't know why this is the order that that we see in Scripture. There are portions of the gospel that is a mystery. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, there's what, some things we won't know until we on the other side arrive in heaven. And I'm convinced there'll be things that we are very convinced of here. Yeah. And we'll get to heaven and be like, oh, I was way wrong yeah. on all sides of yeah. things. But here's what we don't see. We never see permission for men to become abusive. We never see permission for men to become toxic, dictatorial. We never see uh, permission for men to just completely disregard. In fact, if anything, the scripture would tell us as a, as a governing lead in the church, my mission is to accelerate your mission. Right. And so it, 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 that leadership should look like and feel like and sound like I'm living my life for you to become the fullness of of who God created you to be. Which means we want to equip all believers. So regardless of being a male or a female, we want to equip all believers to operate in their God-given giftings and callings. So what is the thing that God has crafted you to do? Um, The scripture talks about if if you're a teacher, teach. If If you're great at hospitality, like show hospitality, like welcome your neighbors, be, create an environment for people. If, if you, if you are a worshiper, worship, like whatever, whatever the, the thing is that God has crafted you to do, we want to empower you to do that. Yeah. That, that would be the goal of the well, church. Well, I think you're a great, a uh, great example of this. You're a gifted communicator. You're a gifted visionary and a gifted leader. And it is it is a backbone for our church. It is a strength that is both seen and felt, and some people will never see that. And that is not because you have to do that right. because we want you to do that. That is because that is how God crafted and created you. Right. Because we have friends who pastor churches, and the wife, she 
really, she feels her ministry is to her kids. Yeah. And her ministry is to support her husband and sit on the front row and encourage and love him and just inspire him. But she doesn't want anything to do with right. the ministry. And we have other friends who the 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 wife, uh, she is a gifted administrator. Yeah. Gifted behind the scenes. Never wants to preach a day in her life. But just gift. So the point is, what? how has God crafted right. you to operate? It is not about being forced into any position because that would be guilty of right. doing exactly what Paul was telling us not to do. Yeah, I think it's just a reminder that in the kingdom of God, there's a place for you. Yeah. And, uh, and that place is determined by your God-given gifts and abilities, by the passions that God's put inside of you, the things that make you come alive when you're, when you're doing that. Come alive come, in the name yeah, of exactly. Jesus, come alive. I just think that that's so important to note. And I was having a great conversation with our daughter, Brooklyn, and um, we were just talking about this issue of uh, just some people feeling like they've got to fight for women to be in leadership yeah. and be in ministry. And she was like, I just don't understand that. And I said, well, babe, because you've been brought up and you've been grown up in an environment where no matter whether you're a male or a female, your gifts are going to be championed in the kingdom of God, how God wired you and created you. We're going to empower you to be that in the kingdom of God. And so I, I just felt like that was something to take note of because she's never had to deal with questions about does my voice matter? Right. Am I allowed to, am I allowed to use my voice? And yeah. so I, that's the kind of environment that, that we have decided we want to create yeah. within the movement church yeah. because we feel like it lines up with the heart of God. Yeah. So let's hit a couple like concepts with this. Like where does this practically, how do you flesh this out? So, so what, what, what we believe in our home and even though on this issue, you're just on the other side of the line yeah, and right I'm here. just on this side. But we're in alignment. Yeah. And and so we believe there's order in the church. We also believe there's order in the home. So the way that we run our home is I tell Megan what. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we run our home. We parent together. We make decisions together. Yeah. We plan the budget together. I don't sit down and tell Megan, here's where you're spending money. Here's where I'm spending money. We plan the budget together. And we operate in roles in our home that we're both yeah. gifted at. That are not masculine or feminine. Yeah. Like for instance, she would leave the house in a, a blouse or clothing that literally looks like it was rubber this is about band to be an exaggeration. and in like a tie dye format, and then it's open back up, and you can't even fully wear because it it's so wrinkled. There's there's and I'm like you traces can't, of you truth can't, in what he's sharing. One hundred percent truth, but you can't leave. You have to go upstairs right now. We have to iron this. And she would be like, oh. I, can't, I can't iron to save my life. I, I iron can't iron all of our clothes. I iron <laughs> t-shirts. I iron. I iron. Sometimes right. I iron swim trunks if they're wrinkly. We both cook. We both cook Probably together. Probably more so me, but but we cook on together. a regular basis. But we cook together. But you do the laundry. Yeah, and and it's and better that she it. does. She hates it, but she does the laundry. And but you gotta have yeah. Clean so clothes. we just, in other words, <laughs> we have roles in our home that aren't based upon. Well, you're the woman, and I'm the man. Yeah. So dip, 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 dip. And and we parent together. Yeah. So we, taking the kids to school isn't her job; it's our job. Which means that if our schedule allows, some days I take, some days she takes. And, and we part of that, that is because we both work. We both work together totally. for the church. But if and I so, only worked and yeah. I drove into the office and I couldn't, you would take the kids to school. Absolutely. But there's nothing in our house that, well, you're the woman, you do this. Or yeah. you're the man, you do this. With few exceptions, like safety would fall under me and the garage Please. that falls under me. But <laughs> just because I'm on. better at the garage. <laughs> But organizing and labeling our cabinets we that falls under me. But, but I, I want you to see and I want you to hear that. But but at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. Because the Bible is clear. One day I'll stand before Jesus and he's gonna take into account how I led my family. Now, I don't know if you can think of a time where maybe three times in 23 years where mm -hmm. I was like, Babe, I need you to get behind this. I know you don't agree, but we're going this way. Yeah, I mean, not very often, but but here's the freedom in that. The freedom in that is simply, and we just had a discussion the other day where I was sharing with you something that I really felt like God was saying, mm -hmm. and you were like, I'm not sure. And um, 
And I was like, okay. I said, well, the truth is, then you let me know when you're sure because I feel like God said this. And if you tell me no, then you're accountable to God. So great, take it up with him. And because there's freedom in that. And that's, that sounds silly. But uh, what I mean is- There's truth in that. It sounds a little snarky. It sounds a little I, weaponizing. I know okay, it's not what you that's meant. That's not what I mean. I know I'm that, just, but the listener may not know okay. that. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm trying to imply is that there's, there's freedom in that to where it's like, okay, I, you ultimately actually are accountable to God for mm -hmm. the decisions that you make. And so there's freedom to be able to go, okay, I can sit back and trust that. And, so. and it, there's freedom for me to, I don't, I very rarely have leaned on that leg, so to speak of I'm the husband, I'm the head of the household because I trust Megan. And so if we're ever at a place in our marriage, I'm going somewhere with this in the church. If we're ever at a place in our marriage where that's a conflict, we go to our pastor mm -hmm. and our pastors are great at this. Yeah. In fact, we have pastors that know how to pastor us in every season of life. And because I don't want, if she doesn't align with me, I don't want to make that decision. Right. And, and if, same in the same, because the, the unity and the beauty is in alignment, Yeah. but that doesn't always happen. So there are times where we aren't aligned, but both passionate. So we get our pastors in, get their feedback and in 99% of the time with that it so it resolves because yeah. we go oh okay i can see oh okay i can see that because even if i stand before jesus i don't want to get there ha having not listened yeah. and and leaned on the wisdom and the value that megan has that's not what god meant when he said Your husbands are the head of the household he's just saying you're going to hold account you're going to be held accountable for yeah. that yeah and so it's important to know that. Yeah. And the same is true for our church. Yeah. We lead our church together. We get away once a year and we dream and we pray about this, the sermon series for the year and big ideas. What's and God trying to say? What's God saying? We pray for the word yeah. for our church. In the last two years, God's given that word to Megan. Like, here's the words. I'm like, okay. Well, I mean, if, he, yeah. if you're hearing it, I'm feeling yeah. it. I trust you. We're in alignment. And uh, we have different roles in the church. That we mm -hmm. play according to Based our gift our mix. Skill exactly. Sets. But when it comes to the operations yeah. and when it comes to the government structure, I sit in the senior pastor role. Yeah. We lead as mom and dad, but I'm held accountable to our board of trustees, yeah. not Megan. I'm held accountable to our annual budget, not Megan. I'm held accountable to our overseers, not Megan. I can't set my own salary for the church, a compensation committee has to set my salary. So even though I am at the highest pinnacle of authority in our church, I'm under three yeah. different layers of authority in my life. That's before I even get to God, because <laughs> then there's going to come a day. And after he talks to me about how I live my life and Jesus is going to talk to me how I was a husband to Megan. And then Jesus is going to talk to me about how I was a father to Brooklyn and Avery. He's going to say, okay, now let's talk about the movement church. And he's going to say, you know, I had a great couple come through that church named Jerry and Katie. And let's talk about how you pastored them. Let's talk about how you pastored Shana and Josh Newman. Did you, did you love them compassionately? Did you build a church where they could grow and their kids could grow? So it's not like I'm, I'm the, the head of the table. I'm the alpha dog. Everyone hear me roar. Because with that, 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 that role of responsibility comes great, great weight and burden. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think is important to note. Yeah. So I, I lead our staff. So as operationally, that's my gift mix. Yeah. Megan is over our communications team and creative and all fun dreaming things. <laughs> and, it's see, my gift mix. It's your gift mix. <laughs> but I just want you to hear the practicals because you, you need those in your life. So again, we believe that, that women not just can be, but should, should be, be. Yeah. empowered to do all things in all capacities of the church. And so should men under the headship of a man, yeah. including the men in the church yeah. under the headship of a man. And yeah. I know that's challenging. I didn't set up the order and the structure and you can take that up with God when you get there and you don't have to agree. And that's okay. In fact, we talked about if we were shopping for a church, what would we look for? Mm -hmm. And we would look for, for me, I would want to know that there is male leadership in the church, but I would never go to a church where there wasn't female leadership in the church either. 
So to me, that's the case. Now we've also coached a a single woman yeah. who became the first lead pastor that Ark ever planted, the Association of Related Churches. We coached her. She's still pastoring to this day in Los Angeles. And I couldn't have been more proud of her. Yeah. I couldn't, I, we were behind her. We helped financially. Yeah. We gave her all the resources we could. It's a non-essential right. component. And we have liberty. And we, we <laughs> have liberty. So I just want you to hear all aspects yeah. of this and, and just kind of hear where we land on that. Is there anything else you want to add as we wrap this thing up? <clears throat> I think we hung a lot on the, the headship. And I think that's a great place because that's where there's so much confusion. But I think in wrapping it up, it's just coming back to the idea that that God created you with a purpose on purpose. And part of that purpose is building the kingdom of God. Yeah. And so, um, male or female, we need both voices. We need, we need, we need unity working together. And, um, I think that just like our cultures become so polarized, I think that it's become polarized sometimes in the church between men and women. Uh -huh. And it's like everyone asserting themselves to try to find their place and to try to assert their voice. And And the truth is, is that we need both. We need men and women working together in unity, focused on the big picture goal, which is advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ and um, not letting all the other stuff get in the way yeah. and not letting ourselves get in the way. Um, I think that becomes an issue sometimes. And so I I just, I just want to reiterate that. Like we need godly men leading the charge, using their voice, operating in the giftings that God's called them as much as we need godly women yeah. doing the same thing. And there's something beautiful about together and God, God just his presence just moves through unity. And so that's the goal is how can we be unified together and, and, and how can we just watch men and women step into the fullness of the calling of God on their life? That's a great so, wrap up. Yeah. Why don't you pray for us and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. Lord Jesus, God, I thank you for this long conversation that we've just had. Um, and God, I just thank you that you care about the church. Yeah. God, that the church was your idea. It was not man's idea. God, I thank you that in building the church that you chose to use all of us. Um, God, I, I think about the scripture, irrespective of how we got here, Lord, you're using us all to build your big picture story, uh, male and female using us together. So yeah. God, I just pray, God, for every person who's listening, God, that we would, we would have open hearts, God, to, to what you want to do in and through our lives, God, that we would have open hearts. And God, I just pray that you would help us to keep the main thing, the main yeah. thing. God, to not get so distracted by arguments and opinions, um, but God, to just really lean in and make the main thing the main thing. Yeah. And the main thing is Jesus yeah. and helping people find Jesus because we know, God, that that is the answer. So Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to have great discussion together and to grow in our faith together. And I pray blessings over every person listening right now in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in for another episode of MC Unpacked. Do us a favor, like and subscribe. Yeah. It helps us spread the word. It lets you get our information as soon as it comes out. That's right. You leave a comment. Let us know some topics and things you'd like for us to hit. And if you're in Orange County, come in see Southern us. California, come and see us. We meet every Sunday yep. morning, 9 and 11 a.m., and we won't be the same without you. That's we right. love you. We'll see you next see time you later. on MC Unpacked.